Whenever I say that, I think people think I'm being glib or fanciful or um, just a bit poetic. Um, I'm really not. Uh, to me, a poem is a contrived utterance that means to have an effect on the way in which someone else thinks or feels. So when I say that I believe a poem is a spell, I'm really not talking metaphorically. It is, to me, precisely that. The second thing I want to say is that I also write um, a lot about spells or about people falling under them or exercising them on others. That's because, to me, the vocabulary of spells is that of negotiation, persuasion, capitulation, manipulation, all the stuff of human relationships, uh, which I think is my real target. Anyway, I'll stop gassing and read some poems. <laughs> this one's about a sexy goat. Goat. Don't fall for it. The side long look, that punted puck of a pupil. Goat wants nothing more than to slip a cleated mitt beneath a fuss of skirts, raise merry hell. Button up. Keep very still. Don't think about that knock kneed hopscotch, dapper, quick stepped, keen the long, tall grin. Goat means to take your shoulder as a bit between his teeth, skipping and out like nifty ribbon work. Call him stick pin. Call him sheer shank. Don't call to him at all. But oh my girl, you will. Call it fancy. Call it whim. Call it a door opening on the slant stair to the room you didn't know was there, though you've lived here all your life. And come down with the dawn. Now you've been gone too long. The dance was over weeks ago. Your guests have all gone home. Now you're shoeless, skint and swindled. Now the daybreak wants to know. Now the piper's piping up beyond the gate. Too late, my girl. Too late. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> one of the reasons I find the um, vocabulary and grammar of, uh, of not just spells but also law generally, or folklore more generally, um, one of the reasons I find it very attractive is that um, for me it's always seemed to be able to create spaces to play with and to play in that are simultaneously generous and intimate, or have the possibility to be generous and intimate. With that, I think it is worth remembering that there's a degree of responsibility. Um, <clears throat> I promise I won't embarrass you too much, Marina, but much of what I've learned on the subject has been from reading Marina's books. Um, and one thing I found very memorable from many years ago was Marina saying that an archetype is a hollow thing, but a dangerous one, um, something that has been removed from the context in which it first appears and goes on spreading false consequences. So I think it's always worth remembering when choosing these rooms to play with and play in that some of these toys are very dangerous. Um, I think that's worth bearing in mind. <clears throat> this, poem, uh, this poem has a snake, which depending on your predilections as a reader is more or less Freudian. <laughs> We're not supposed to parley, ropey Joe. I meant to close my eyes and shut the door. But you're a slender fellow, ropey Joe, thin enough to slip beneath the door and spill your wicked dosy -si dough in curlicues and hoops across the floor. I'll be here, and I'm all ears. There are things I want to know. Tell me, tell me, tell me about absinthe and Yahtzee and sugar skulls and ginger and dynamite and hearsay and all the girls and boys who lost their way and the places in the woods we're not to go, and all the games we're not allowed to play, there are so many things to know. My mother's got the supper on the go. My father will be sagging in his chair. But you're a speedy fellow, ropey Joe, quick enough to slide behind his back a wicked line of dominoes, zipping through the hall and up the stairs. Come on, pal, I'm ready now. There are things I want to know. Tell me, tell me, tell me about lightning and furies and ligatures and diamonds and zip wires and gooseberries and all the girls and boys who went astray 
and all the ones who never got to go, and all the words we're not supposed to say. There are so many things to know. They told me you were trouble, Ropey Joe. You've always got to tip the apple cart. But you're a subtle fellow, Ropey Joe, suave enough to worm your way inside and pin your wicked mistletoe above the crooked lintel to my heart. Come on then, shimmy in. There are things I want to know. Tell me, tell me, tell me about hellhounds and rubies and pretty boys and bad girls and runaways and lost boys and all the things that made my mother cry and all the things he said to make her stay and all the things we're not allowed to say. There are so many things to know. <clears throat> I know that Marina is going to be reading something about mermaids, unless that's changed. <laughs> um, I thought, therefore, uh, to, to synthesize, I would read something on a companionable myth uh, about selkies. If you're not familiar with the Selkie myth, it's, uh, the idea is that Selkies are uh, seal maidens, and when they come to the shore, they take off their seal skin. And if you can find a Selkie's seal skin, obviously this, this, this myth has much in common with others, if you can find a Selkie's seal skin um, and hide it, you get to keep the seal maiden. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot that I find quite disturbing about that myth. <laughs> But there's also a lot that I recognise as quite true in terms of, um, in terms of uh, the intimacy and the bondage that we think of in terms of romantic or sexual relationships. Um, so, <laughs> a poem which I suppose I, I, I ought to prime by saying also deals in some more literal forms of bondage. Key. Strung up like this, you've got me, boy, I'm yours. Better dress those knots before I count to ten. Lark's head, bowline, daisy chain. It's wicked fun, but it's a game. Ah, oh, but now you're scared again. The empty bed, the rifle drawers, the busted hinges squawking never more. Well, sure, there's a life hung in the cupboard, and it twitches when I twitch, the stitches pull. But there's a hundred more beyond this room, and I'm still here. Listen now, it's really simple. You've got something and it belongs to me. I don't mean that old skin, the useless key you fret and fret about, wide-eyed and seal slick. The door was open all along, the knots secure. I am, um, <clears throat> I'm going to finish with, I've talked, I've talked a bit about spells. I haven't included one single curse, um, which would be really <laughs> disappointing. Um, uh, while I was reading last night, um, I was reading this book of poetry. It's not mine, um, but I picked this up in Havana. It's a Cuban poet called uh, Eliseo Diego. And um, I read these four lines and sat bolt upright in bed. And I thought, oh, that's really good. <laughs> I thought, oh, oh, I'll read that tomorrow. Fantastic. There's my curse. Um, <clears throat> you'll have to excuse an ad hoc translation. Um, uh, the poem is called the, Re the Reproach of the Royal Cat. Uh, I should explain that Eliseo Diego did, uh, translated a lot of uh, fairy stories into Spanish. Um, <clears throat> so the lines in the original Spanish are <clears throat> Tus ojos de ámbar me han mirado tan fijamente desde tan lejos que he sentido bajo mis pies las árridas noticias de la mal maldición. <clears throat> My ad hoc English translation is uh, Your amber eyes have watched me so intently and from so far away that I have felt beneath my feet the dry news of a curse. Thank you. No one curse Marina, please. <laughs> Actually, I think you blessed me, which is, um, which is better. Um, 
Well, um, I actually wrote this story, which I chose. Uh, for, um, I chose it for two reasons. One, that I wrote it when a friend of mine was very, very ill, and in fact she died. But um, she asked for her friends to send her some, some stories, and it sort of just came to my head. She was called Marie-Claude de Brunoff, and she, um, and, uh, she was an artist, and she had often made sort of fantasy images with creatures like mermaids in them. And then I chose it for today because... Um, I so associate the Caribbean with mermaids. I don't know if that's historically correct, um, but then with such fantasy creatures, perhaps history doesn't matter so much. It's called Melusine, a mermaid tale. Under the sea, the mobile signal flutters and fails, and darling Melusine's voice was only coming through in coughs and splutters. I do wish they'd improve our reception. It's so tiresome to have to raise your voice to a yell when you're trying to pour all your tact and diplomacy into your cowrie. But I realized that some of the interruptions were caused by Melusine's gasps between her sobs. She loves drama, I know, but even while sighing to myself that she's still a teenager au fond, I began to be upset for her. She was crying, I told him he mustn't. Then her words broke up and vanished. I waited, but nothing more came. So I said to her, or rather I trumpeted into the shell phone, Darling, it isn't the end of the world. Why don't you come and see me, and I'll make us a bite, and we can talk. I couldn't eat a thing, she wailed. There was a whir and a buzz, and then her small voice returned. You're an angel, Morgan. I'll be there in this weather in less than an hour. Melusine is my niece. Her mother found Arthur alone and palely loitering by a lake one winter morning during his questing days. And you know the rest. She saw a lily on his brow, and he shut her eyes with kisses for. When he woke up, he remembered nothing, only the bliss of it, and the unappeasable longing that a fairy encounter trails in its aftermath. Melusine was the result. I was happy to be seeing her again, though she only ever comes to see her aunt when there's a crisis, and I began gathering together some light ingredients for our supper a crab from my fish pens and some samphire I'd surfaced to pick up from the dunes. Melusine's appetite could be coaxed, I knew. She arrived and dashed herself against my breast with a small and terrible cry. Holding Melusine in one's arms is like standing under a waterfall on a very hot day. I stepped back, almost crushed by the force of her passionate proximity, and looked at her. My dear girl, I couldn't help marveling. Despair agrees with you. I've rarely seen you look so splendid. Oh, don't say that, she wailed. You're just saying it to make me feel better. I'm old, I'm getting to look old, which is worse, and I don't want to be able to be my age and someone to cherish me in spite of it. I'm 80 next birthday, after all, she howled. I couldn't help snorting. That's around 150 years younger than me, and I am still who I am, Morgan. Morgan Le Fay, and when I choose, I can raise to the surface of the sea a vision of my fairy castle in its depths and mirror, mirror it on the clouds from one end of the horizon to the other. A sailing passing overhead in his ship will long only to dive down into the turquoise, then into the emerald, then into the dark purple of the sea's depths in search of my mirage. I'll draw him on and look down from my kitchen range and say, as I am doing now, I have some nice fresh crab for supper. So Melusine um, tells her that she's had this love affair with um, a young Italian on the beach in, a country, in, a, in, a, in another country, and that um, she has decided, because she loves him so much, that she wants to tell him who she really is. So one night, I decided to give him a, gl a glimpse of who I really am. I checked back a groan. On certain days of every month, mermaids need to take a bath. Sorry, yes, mermaids need to take back mermaid fall, form. Like a pearl oyster in the shoals of a tidal estuary, Melusine can survive out of her element for a while, at the very limit from one new moon to the next, but periodically she must return to the water. Melusine was rushing on. I said to Gianni, come, I have something I want you to watch. I thought it would excite him, and the risk of doing it there on land excited me too. I took him into our little bathroom. I kissed him on the lids, once, twice, and then again both sides, and told him to keep his eyes tight shut till I said he could open them. I ran a bath and added a whole bag of salt to the water and lay down in it. 
Then I began humming to myself my own transformation music. Melusine, I couldn't help interrupting. Everybody knows a mortal can't survive hearing the siren singing. You didn't. Till now, her story was like every story of a summer love affair. But now I was truly curious. Had Melusine been the death of this young man? First, my hair sprang out in its full mane from my head. Then my scales began to grow from my waist upwards, downwards, t tingling me with their cool and pointed tips. And I whispered to Gianni, you can have a peep now. My fins were pushing out from my ribs and my tail fin unfurling, even fuller and glossier than before. I was in mid-metamorphosis. Melusine stopped. She could see my dismay. I couldn't feel help feeling sorry for her boyfriend, who'd done nothing except pick up a pretty girl at a party. Oh, Morgan, cried Melusine, don't look like that. Jeannie was staring at me in the bath, with his eyes bulging and making all these noises. I thought he was having a heart attack. He had such an avid look on his face. I told him he mustn't do that. He was scaring me. But I thought it was love, pure human craving, hot human love, the kind we mermaids don't usually know, which Gianni and I had been having all through the night, days and nights in our little summer apartment with the bay outside sparkling. But no, Melusine dashed the tears from her eyes and blew her nose hard. He began laughing and leering at me and he said to me, well, two can play at that game. Bloody hell, there I was, lying all vulnerable in the bath, dreaming to myself about the sea so that I could come back in my natural shape, trusting him to see who I really am. And he, meanwhile, was turning himself back into wh whatever it is he really is. Some kind of a loathsome demon with fangs and spikes and horns. And he was slavering. I had no time to discover more. I needed every bit of my powers to magic myself back down to the sea and safe into the depths again. She sniffed. It was a close run thing, I'm telling you. She recomposed her face and cursed furiously, then dissolved again and sobbed. I thought he really loved me. He's the only one I really wanted to stay with. I didn't want to come back to this life, this aloneness under the sea where there's nothing to do, no one to hang out with. She checked her eye shell and shook her head sadly. I was frowning at her and she shot back. It may be all right for you down here, she pouted, but I just can't get over his pretending all that time and that when I was doing my metamorphosis, just to give him pleasure and show how much I cared, he only wanted to eat me. <laughs> oh, darling, surely not. Yes, replied Melusine glumly. After he said to me, two can play at that game, do you know what he added? I shook my head. He had a nerve. He said, besides, I just love sushi. so much <laughs> Marina and Abby and <clears throat> I've been thinking about things I would ask in this panel for a long time and I did some of my best thinking in preparation when I was looking at Avengers Endgame and later that day when I was looking at Game of Thrones I, I say that to say that clearly our international fascination with fable and fantasy is not only all too real, in some ways it feels more vivid than it ever did. And it's not to say that Abby and Marina are writing about Jon Snow or Captain America. But as you can see, there's nothing lacking in the worlds they're creating. And I thought we could begin with beginnings. When did the idea of not just inhabiting fantasy worlds, but writing about them, when and how did that begin? Go ahead. Go. I, um, for my part, um, that, that wasn't something I set out to do, I don't think. And, and actually, I find that division between, um, let's say, the fantasy world and I, what's on the other end of that? <laughs> like, like, like realism? I, I, 
I've, I suppose when, when I think of a when I think of the world I inhabit, that's that's not a that's not a that's not a purely real world, <laughs> and and I think if you if, if you I think you are immediately leaving out um, well uh, any dream one has ever had, uh, any any time one has been a child, any fever one has ever had, any ambivalent thought you've ever had. If you're leaving out the fantasy worlds, um, that that grammar and that vocabulary is something that actually I think we inhabit all the time. I think there are certain off-the-peg structures that make that easier to talk about with other people. But but I think, I think, I, I, I do tend, to, I, I think personally, I don't know how you feel, Marina, I think of myself as, operate, as occupying rather a, a series of discontinuous but overlapping series of fantasy worlds and, uh, and, and, and mythologies, and some of those mythologies are extremely dangerous. Um, and I think that's quite a good question to ask of anything. Sorry, I, I can see myself building up to a, a witter <laughs> um, um, to ask of anything. What, what, what myth is that built on? Um, I think most of the time we are operating, we're, we're on these sort of stilts of mythic thinking, personally. No, I agree with that. And I also very much with all the things you said about language. And I think that the power of both of myths and of language itself in shorter forms, in poetry forms, or even in proverbial forms, um, needs, in a way, constantly be reflected upon. I mm. think you hinted at that as well. Because we can, and actually Gary's earlier talk, when he talked about the sort of myths that surround you know, stranger violence or invader violence, yes. or now we have, of course, in Europe, a lot of myths about migration and the dangers, you know, we have, there's a lot of false consciousness. Um, but I think it's wrong not to think that, that fantasy and imagination can actually also um, combat false consciousness. One, one, the, the, one of the Enlightenment problems has been that it's thought that only reason will do that. But actually, reason is not captivating. You know, the, the great reasonable philosopher, Voltaire, realized that, that he realized that his ideas were not going to be communicated unless he actually wrote something like Candide. Yeah. So he wrote a really, really hilariously awful satirical fable. And then he really managed to skewer the Jesuits and all the other things that he wanted to do. So, <laughs> whereas before, nobody read his dry philosophy. So actually, <laughs> so, yes. well, but I mean, it's, uh, so it's actually important that we, so it's a weapon. And, and of course, on the whole, liberals have thought that they shouldn't sort of resort to these weapons, of propaganda, propaganda weapons like the enemy does. But actually, I've, I've come to think that we conceded too much ground. And a lot of the writers I like reading are writers who take on these, these, these problems and, and actually try to, Ursula yeah. Le Guin, for example, a wonderful fantasy writer, has you know, done some extraordinary feminist novels in which she tries to rethink sexual relations. N not in a realist terms, because in realist terms you can't do it. You need to th imagine something or some alternative. And, and the other thing I'd like to say is that I believe in escapism. I think, it's, I think that's another sort of skill joy philosophy that took over. That somehow it's sort of childish to escape with a book. If, if you actually have the chance to get into another world through a book, when you're depressed, when the world is horrible, you know, it's rather like listening to music too. If you can actually lose yourself in that, you really do feel better. Mm -hmm. And so this should not be disparaged as escapism. This is mental health. You know. Yes. I quite agree. Yes, I think if this panel goes either very, very well, which I think it will, not because of me, or very, very badly, we can say either way, it's a mythology. <laughs> uh, as you probably have, have remarked upon and realized, both Abby and Marina are working in and have worked in multiple languages. For Abby, it's Spanish. Marina, it's French, Italian, and has been Arabic. No, well, I lost it. I lost it. I, I knew it when I was little, but I don't know. It it's now. there somewhere still in a parallel dimension, like a, a pocket universe. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, what would you say has been the effect of being polyglottal? What has that done to your writing and also to your reading habits? Has it changed how you enjoy literature as differently? Oh, that's, that's a really good question, but I'm going to hand over to you first. <laughs> that's all right. Well, I think it's one of the great signs of. of sort of, of um, vitality in the cultural world, that there is now a lot of cross-cultural dialogue. 
Um, and it's, it, it was exa I bring an example was that we heard a French writer today, and that's mm. the first time a French writer's come to the Bocas. But I think they probably wanted one before, but badly. But yes. yes but, it is, but so, um, but and I, and I so so I see that, and, and I also think that it's um, there's a sort of common language across borders that translation helps one to recognize. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, la the language of folklore, I mean, a figure like the mermaid, um, or your, you know, the name of your book, Jinx. Yes. She's, a, she's you, you tell her story, but just to say that that kind of figure has something to do with a female voice, what happens to the female voice. These are very common myths. I mean, they turn up in different shapes and sizes with different contexts. But the idea of a strangled girl yes. can't speak or a mermaid is something that many cultures will have produced. So there's a kind of dialogue that happens at that level of imaginative figures and ciphers and images, which then can get enriched and form bridges between us. Marina, Jinx, yes. oh, forgive me, I didn't mean to. Will you tell the story of Jinx? <laughs> because, oh no, please do. <laughs> like, I, would, I, 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 I could wit her on for ages. But the, the mythic figure. But I, but yes. I'd love to hear it from you. Oh. <laughs> well, she's one of many nymphs. Are you sure? I've yes, I am sure. She's, she's one of many nymphs who sees something she shouldn't see. And as a result, she's punished. And she's punished. And the word jinx actually means to be strangled. It's, a, it's from a, it's from, yeah, well, I think it's, it's from Greek. So it's got a kind of, so she's throttled in her voice because she's seen a love affair that she shouldn't have seen and she whispers. Oh, sorry. She's seen a love, she's seen, I mean, I'm, I actually haven't refreshed my memory, but. Um, and, um, and so, the, and, and the idea, the, 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 the glissando idea of, of the strangled voice and the spell is that a spell binds you. Yes. It's exactly yours. So it's a, it's, a, it's a knot of language that binds you into its, into its um, power. Yes. Um, forgive me, if I, is that right if I just riff off that a little? So the jinx is also, if, unless I'm mistaken, is, a, is some sort of device that is alluded to in Pindar, and no one's quite sure exactly what it is. It might be a bird, or it might be some sort of wheel-like contraption, or it might be a bird strapped to a wheel. Um, but whatever it is, it's a very powerful form of yes. uh, love spell. And, and yes, in fact, yes. Jason uses it to seduce Medea. Yes. Yes. Um, and um, the, but the idea is that you hear it, and you fall under your spell, uh, fall under its spell. And that, uh, that uh, it's something that's incredibly interesting to me, this, uh, this idea of the power of speech to affect change, and it was very interesting to, 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 to the ancient Greeks as well. This, this I Hello? Yep. <laughs> Ironically, <laughs> the, the, uh, the, the idea of the utterance, the utterance that gave you power over someone mm. else. Um, mm. And, and, and there are con obviously there are concerns there, but there's great fascination there as well. Um, that's, that's hugely interesting to me. I mean, I don't know about the both of you, but I do spend an awful lot of time thinking about how I might curse people. <laughs> and, and so if, if this has occurred to, to either or both of you, if you could cast one spell or one curse, you know, indefinitely for your entire life, but just that one on anyone, what would that be? I, ha I have ready answers, but, and, and perhaps you thought about this too. <laughs> I. I'm not sure I can tell you because I because I used to cast a lot of spells when I was when I was like a child. I was convinced I was I was like very endowed with all kinds of sympathetic magic. <laughs> and if I wanted to cast a spell, if I felt something like very intensely, what I would do is I would think it's so hard and I'd tie a knot in something and then I'd hide the knot. And um, and and that to me is so now I write a poem. <laughs> It's, it's the same thing. You're sort of making this raw thing, this quintessence, this this thing we uh, this gathering together, um, and that's that to me is a knot. But I don't hide them in. I can't say where I hid them. I don't. <laughs> they're still out there, spreading their consequences. I don't hide them anymore. I um, I, I, I I give them to people to to read. <laughs> I think I think that some some writing, actually, one writes to exactly do what you say. And I think it's actually not a, quite a, not a bad thing to do for one's own state of being. But, but curses, as Abigail said, are dangerous, actually. And one of the things that the literature of curses tells one is not to mess with them. 
because actually you are not in charge of them. They have a life of their own and they will go out into the world and they will do harm in ways that you did not expect. I so that, like Marina's that, giving me very good counsel here. <laughs> <laughs> Just for my own safety, and I feel like I, I will but think I, about this more responsibly yeah. now. No, no, but there is another, there is a sort of flip side, oh. which is, which is the, the, not the curse, but the, the prevention, the, the, which is a sort of, which is the blessing that tries to keep something at bay. Yeah. So it's not actually that you directly curse it. So you don't say, you don't try to turn Medusa's hair to snakes, because that might come back to haunt <laughs> you. Mm -hmm. But you but take Medusa and you use her as a shield to protect you against some unnameable terror that might come your way. Mm. Well, I have my plans for tonight. And, <laughs> but I, I think this, this ties in really well with the idea of this kind of writing as a social responsibility. And Abby, I think you know that I was deeply moved in all kinds of ways by reading Jinx. And I found in the margins of my notebook, after having read it, I wrote that Abigail uses transformative power in her collection of poems, almost as if she's wielding ambidextrously. And in one hand, she's curing, and in another hand, she is maiming. And it, it's, it's just a hell of a book, and you have to spend time with it. But it made me think about what responsibility folklorists and fabulists have with handling, as Marina said, things that are dangerous and should be taken seriously. Yes, uh, writers, writers too, <laughs> obviously, um, and, and, and generally, actually, not just writers, anyone that uses language, that's, it, 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 has, it has those capabilities to do, to do both. I mean, speaking from my own aesthetic tastes, um, when I was growing up, the, the poetry I loved was, was, was the one where I, I felt some violence had been done to me, I felt like something had happened. Um, where, and, and you're quite right, those, those, those two things are very, very close together. Uh, that, that which is effective and salutary, and that which is painful in, in those terms, certainly well, who, in terms of what who I learned. Who, who, did, who were you reading? Who did I read? I, I, <laughs> so the other person I love to embarrass like, every time I get the chance is Maura Dooley. Maura, Maura Dooley was my, was my, was, was my favourite poet and someone I obsessed over as a, a child. And, and, and actually, I think I, I was guilty of, as a child of of learning everything in theory before I ever encountered it in practice. And of course, there's, this, there's not just a fault line, there's a huge gulf between what you read and what you then encounter. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I went into the adult world convinced I knew everything, having read about it in Maura's, in Maura's books, in, in her very savage, tender poems. Um, but those two are very close together, you're right. I could clearly, as you can see, talk to Abby and Marino till, well, you know, a long time. But I would like at this point to open the floor to questions or provocations and not curses. Please don't curse any of us, but we'd love to hear from you. Thank you, thank you, all three of you very much. This is absolutely fascinating. I'm just wondering how or if you relate your your use of folklore to um, archetypes, Jungian archetypes, because it seems to me that, well, the Selkie, for example, is an archetype. So is the mermaid and the young man who turns into <laughs> a monster. Um, are these, do you relate these consciously or unconsciously to Jungian archetypes? I, I tend not to use, um, I mean, the, I sometimes use the word, but I, I don't really actually use Jungian theory because, uh, as Abigail actually said, I think that the historical context um, changes the, theory, the, the archetypes very dramatically over time. And there are some archetypes that really have now uh, such a different function in the world from when they were first identified. I, I would say, for example, the wicked stepmother. The, I mean, this, this is a real problem for children now, that there are so many wicked stepmothers in fairy tales. And um, because the, the, the situation of stepmothers is utterly different. There used to be many, many more because of, uh, of um, female mortality in childbirth. 
and there were different social circumstances. So even while some of that still happens, I'm not denying that women can be very wicked as stepmothers, but it's difficult now that children who have a stepmother who's very, very longing to be loved and love them and is actually coming up against a tremendous wall of this immovable archetype, which is not rooted in psychology, I don't think. It's rooted in history and social mm -hmm. circumstance. So I tend to try not to... Uh, sometimes I do, in fiction, work with archetypes in a sense to, de to destabilize them. Mm. I mean, I have often done that, actually. So I have, uh, you know, witches and things like that, and there. That's a very common, in my generation, feminist practice, to, to, to rework the archetype in such a way that you undermine it. And I, I think, um, in order to pick something up and use it, whatever it may be now, I think... Um, I think I, I really, I'm trying to avoid just trying to sort of poorly gloss what Marina said. <laughs> but for me, that has to be some sort of metonymic logic. It's still, for it still to be fresh, it still has to mean something. And if you're using that responsibly, it has to mean what, what you mean it to mean. Um, so so I, think, I, I think in terms of what one picks up and uses, as you say, some will make more sense than others. But, but certain myths are, are based on relatively perennial truths um, that continue to sort of as, as you say, so they continue to. You have, you have to be careful that you're not sort of further propagating something false. Um, but there are certain there are certain motifs that one might be able to use that that make sense and have always, have always made sense. But, but metonymically, that uh, that has to make poetic sense, as I suppose what I'm saying. Evelyn. I'm not quite sure how to ask this question. It's, it, it kind of picks up on the last question and what you just said there, Abby, about certain myths having perennial truths. It, the Selkie is a Celtic myth. The mermaid, I'm not sure of. But the, there's also the old heeg in the Caribbean, you know, the woman who sheds her skin? Mm. And if you find the skin and you sprinkle salt on it, she can't get back in. Yes. But the, the old heeg, eh? Sorry. <laughs> Sukriya, yeah, all right, old heeg in Jamaica, whatever. Um, you know, what I, want to, what I want to ask is how much of mythology, myths, perennial truths, stories that keep recirculating century after century, because they deal with certain human truths, are international or transnational, and how many, what aspect of them are made by a culture? Can we refer to myths, and not folk tales, because that is very much culturally determined, but can we refer to mythology as something shared by every culture, or very much made by that particular culture? Mm. Something on that. <laughs> Well, the, 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 there are there are there are some there are fundamental questions, and and the, and the ancient myths. Um, I mean, one aspect of mythology, on the whole, is that it tends to be placed at the beginning of a culture. For some reason, we think of it like that. It's the oldest part. It's the oldest core. So, um, the, the the questions that these uh, as, this astonishing body of stories, which is inexhaustible. I mean the. The, the variety and richness of the cult, of every culture, I mean, Scandinavia, uh, Aboriginal, you know, are unbelievable. They answer questions about cosmology, always, death, always, love, sex, children, survival. They ask the big questions. Mm -hmm. And the, I mean, they just offer you such a kind of extraordinary wealth of responses. I mean, I, um, went to Scandinavia recently, uh, to Iceland, and, you know, it's just, it, it, I, I had read some Norse myths, but I had no idea of the extent of this. So, but they're not identical, but they answer the similar questions. And um, I think I, 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 I'm, uh, I think I rather glibly <laughs> mentioned earlier um, the vocabulary and grammar of, uh, of the stuff that one picks up. I think... Um, in terms of grammar, um, I, I, I do expect there to be a degree of cultural inflection, or perhaps when things are repackaged for children, things become different, edges are softened, so things become different, or, or perhaps it's not really grammar. Yes. No, I think it is grammar rather than syntax I'm talking about. In terms of the vocabulary, that's slightly different, that's much more freeform. Um, 
as, as Marina was saying, um, it doesn't, it's not a huge leap to think of a snake as a penis. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not that strange that that should crop up everywhere. Um, so, um, so for me, that's the difference. And, and, and that, that to me as well reflects a difference that I think about a lot, which is, um, which is that between storytelling and, that, uh, and poetic logic. Um, I, I feel for many years now, I've, um, I've, I've, I've heard, I'm, I'm not going to make myself any friends with this, I'm sure, but um, I've, I've heard a lot about the importance of stories, and I absolutely agree that stories are really, really important to tell, but I feel what that leaves out um, is the idea that that's only one form of logic, and that actually poetic logic is, is important in a different way, and actually stories can be extremely damaging as well. Narrative tends to flatten very complex things into a two-dimensional space, and narratives are also where blame is apportioned. Like th things happen in a narrative that don't happen in a poem. So I think of a poem as entertaining. Sorry, I've rather wandered off track here. <laughs> I, think, I think the poem. I think the poem is, is dealing much more in the vocabulary of these things, and uh, and and being able to deal in multiple things and ambivalences simultaneously. That's. That's why I'm a poet. But but the point that joins that up is that actually most of the earliest. Uh, mythological uh, vehicles are poems. I mean, there's almost no prose at the beginning. Um, just returning to the, the archetype and the, that wicked stepmother. I have a stepmother and she's far from wicked. She's actually quite lovely, but that's not the point. Um, most of us would have grown up with the tales collected and written by either Charles Perrault or by the Brothers Grimm. And the Hansel and Gretel story that you think of that the, the Grimm brothers put together, the, I was brought up obviously reading them or having them read to me in translation that the stepmother was the ones that we don't have enough food and urged the father and convinced the father to set the, the two children out into the woods. When I became a mother myself and had to read the stories to my children, Actually, one of the versions I had was not a stepmother, but the mother. There was no mention of the mother being anybody other than the biological mother of these two children, which, which I found interesting, because I'm always intrigued when, when we look at um, deconstructing things around women being somehow automatically maternal and automatically going to be these great um, selfless beings throwing oil down for their children. And um, have, I, I just wondered whether others had come across these, um, this mother in Hansel and Gretel actually being the mother, not the stepmother. And two, perhaps asking ourselves why over time, if that is in fact the case, why over time this mother was then repackaged as a stepmother. Because having real mothers only being one dimensional as all sacrificing is a huge encumbrance. And it's a way of defining a certain gender relationship, which keeps us in our place. Hmm. Well, well it's, I mean, the, 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 the Hansel and Gretel story was uh, taken down by the Grimm's uh, with a mother. And then it was changed by them because they didn't want the mother to be culpable. Yeah. Um, and, um, and they did that to several stories. I mean, they, were at, they were, especially one of the brothers, was very um, kind of sensitive about uh, morality and and had a vision of domestic harmony <laughs> that, that the stepmother could, you know, she could be dispensed with. Um, but that's a very good example of how stories are constant metamorphosis. They are always being rewritten. Even when people say they're not doing it, they do it. And they write it in the light of their own, which is why we have to be conscious as writers of what we're trying to, well, not always conscious, because a lot of good writing comes from the unconscious, but <laughs> anyway, sorry. I think that being said, um, Marina and Abby are going to bless us with brief final readings. Marina will go first. Oh, okay. <laughs> Who is trying to curse Marina? Stop it, please. <laughs> Some of the stories I write, I write because I'm asked to, which I, I really like to be told to write a story to a deadline. It helps me. So this is an, a, an anthology called The Outcast Hours. And we were asked to think about living at night. And um, I, at the time, there were you know, a huge amount of people fleeing 
uh, across uh, from Syria. So I, t I wrote a story about th that, and, um, and it's got a, v a vision in it, and visions are quite related to spells um, in the sense, and, and to oracles, because they often start in a vision, the v you see the future. So, The first day after what was to be the final conclusive raid and the end of their town, before they were gathered up with the others and swept for days onwards, trudging by night towards the border. Zubaida was holding Nur in the crook of her body as they lay deep in a ditch by the road, hiding from the drones as best they could. And she saw a man stepping through the stony field as if it were a summer meadow. There was green light haloing his strong, lean body and playing around his bare head, his soft curls falling to his shoulders seemed fronds rather than hair. When he touched Zubaida on the arm, she felt a bolt of light come off him, live and quick and fresh, as if she were a fruit and he had plucked her at the perfect moment of ripeness. He smiled, while at the same time putting a finger to his lips, to indicate that Zubaida should not stir or speak and wake the little girl. And then he leant in close to Zubaida's ear and said, his words passing through her as if he had struck a clear bell. When the fence falls, and it shall, You'll see your son, Tamim, again. Don't forget, when the fence falls in the place of thorns. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to finish with the, the very oldest poem in the book. Um, it was written nearly 10 years ago. Um, <clears throat> I know very few poets who don't have a poem about a hair. Um, he's, he's catnip, um, and I'm not immune to the catnip. Um, when I was very small, my uncle told me a, a number of things. My uncle was always filling my head with absolute nonsense, but one of the things that he told me was that if you see a hare in a field and you want to catch the hare, you can't walk towards it because the hare will run away. You have to walk in rings around the hair and make the rings tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter until eventually you're right next to the hair and then you can just pick him up. Um, I think that's bollocks, um, <laughs> but I've never had a chance to try it. And many years later, I worked, on, I worked as the doorman on a hedge maze and um, like Europe's longest hedge maze. Um, and <laughs> that, that, that we sold various books in the gift shop about mazes and labyrinths. And then I got to read about the, the difference between a maze and a labyrinth, apparently, is that a labyrinth is unicursal. It's just got the one track, and you walk it for ritual purposes, for contemplation. A maze you can get lost in. Um, <clears throat> so all these things collided <laughs> in, in this poem. <clears throat> Thank you so much for having us. You dreamed the field was a tin grid, latticed with running hairs, march mad and stargazy, their quick jolts the firing of neurons, 